Well, thank you for reconvening with us here uh, at 1030 with Father John Ford, uh, who is a professor of theology at Catholic University of America. I had the privilege to study with him several times, privileged to be on the Newman Association of America with him. And uh, I'm, I can I have to embarrass you a little bit that the Newman Association of America voted him with an outstanding new award about a year or two ago uh, for his contributions on the study of Newman. So I, I can't I couldn't think of a, a better person to, to represent the entire Newman uh, Association of America and who was linking into the SCOTUS studies and who was part of the symposium we held first in October in 2010, Father Ford. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to begin with a personal experience. Half a dozen years ago, I was here at Notre Dame for cataract surgery. Uh, what you don't realize when you have cataracts uh, is that your vision slowly deteriorates. And I didn't realize how much it deteriorated until after the operation. Mm. And take the patch off the eye, and suddenly lucidity, clarity, and suddenly details that I have been missing. I want to use that personal story as a symbol of reading Father Peter's essay in the Newman's Codus Reader. Uh, in other words, then, what I am indebted to, what uh, readers are indebted to from your essay, clarity. Right? And secondly, with details. And so I'm very much appreciative of that essay. And I like to use my own presentation as a springboard for that essay. Mm. Uh, the first thing about uh, Father Peter's essay uh, is it is an umbrella of topics. And so my first thought was, well, try to address all the topics that you <laughs> presented in that essay. And I realized that that would end up sounding something like uh, reading the telephone book. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, what I decided to do was focus in on one topic. But which topic should I choose mm -hmm. to focus? I must admit uh, that the topic that I chose for my presentation, I've uh, already emailed uh, to Father Fellner and to Father Ed uh, a copy of the presentation. Uh, I would simply like to use an outline for uh, my comments. That way we can open up to Father Peter's response uh, to any other comments. My choice of topics is the issue of faith, and particularly the issue of an ascent of faith. First of all, in terms of Newman, it is a recurrent topic in Newman's writings. Uh, in his sermons from a pastoral dimension, in his grammar of ascent from a theological dimension. So the question of revelation and faith are interwoven into Newman's presentation. <clears throat> However, what aspect of faith? And the topic that I chose was the ascent of faith, and particularly in light of the current concern about new evangelization. Parenthetically, new evangelization, it seems to me, is a recurrent topic in the history of the church, because each generation has to evangelize anew and again. But what is proper, what is, if you will, special to the new evangelization today? And I would like to suggest two groups, and here to use a bit of current jargon. Uh, one are the nuns. Please note that it is N-O-N-E-S, <laughs> uh, not uh, in UNS, all right? Uh, and these are the people who have no religion. Maybe they don't have anything against religion, uh, but it simply is not on their radar screen. And the second are the people that I would call stems. 
uh, the people whose background is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, the background um, is not one where the question of God, question of religion, enters into their horizons. Right? Um, my uh, thinking, first of all, is what would Newman say today? And here I find that his grammar of ascent offers a paradigm, offers a way of analyzing how faith works. But the counterpoint is, why doesn't faith always work? And so this is a question of point counterpoint. Uh, when <coughs> Newman approaches the question of faith, he approaches it not from the question of how should people think, parenthetically, how should people believe, he approaches the question from how do people believe, from the actuality, from the uh, existential. And in uh, Newman's approach, uh, the process of thinking, which is also the process of believing, a person asks questions, a person considers the data, Newman's terminology, a person makes inferences, and eventually, sometimes this is practically instantaneous, sometimes it is a matter of years, even decades, the person makes an ascent. Right? Uh, so then, uh, for Newman, the process, it seems to me, there are three pivotal steps. The first step is apprehension, the second step is inference, and the third step is ascent. A few comments about each part of the process. Uh, the format, whether we're talking about simple mathematics, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C, or whether we're talking about a life decision, what should I do with my life, should I believe the process qua process is the same? The elongation, the time that it takes, the content of the subject matter is variable. It can be very simple, it can be very complex. The process, when it comes to the real world, is always personal and always problematic. Mm. Uh, personal in the sense that I am responsible for the decisions that I make in the real world. Problematic is that the way you see the real world and the way that I see the real world inevitably are going to be different. And, uh, what I'd like to suggest is that if we look at Newman's process, Newman, of course, is writing the grammar of the sense from an apologetic standpoint, from an invitational standpoint. He wants you to believe. But in that process, there are also some disconnections. There are also some places where derailment can take place, where the process, if you will, does not continue to the desired ascent. The first step for Newman is the step of apprehension. And here Newman's view of apprehension uh, is a via media. A via media or a middle way between people who look at apprehension like the signet ring pressed on the wax and the people who say that apprehension is I got to get my mind conformed to the external reality, what I would call a one-to-one -one correspondence view of apprehension. For Newman, apprehension is the individual in dialogue with the object or with the reality that the individual is uh, considering. And there is the first step in consideration, what objects are I, what objects are we going to consider? And here, uh, to give um, 
a rather homey illustration. Uh, I want to use the contrast between Eskimos and Hawaiians. And the contrast for purpose of illustration uh, is uh, some one of my students told me that uh, in uh, the, among the Eskimos, there are literally dozens of words for snow. <laughs> uh, as a person who graduated from Notre Dame, I have had enough snow for the entirety of my life. <laughs> so I am not interested in dozens of words for snow. And I suspect Hawaiians kind of feel the same way. Right? Now, why in the process of apprehension some realities are important and comprehensive for one group of people and not for another group of people. For the Eskimos, survival depends upon the kind of snow. Uh, and consequently, then, it's important to be able to describe the kind of snow that you're dealing with. Uh, for uh, Hawaiians, uh, who cares about snow, right? Now, the first thing that I would like to suggest is uh, the Hawaiians are sort of like the stems or vice versa. In other words, then, uh, if Hawaiians don't care about snow, stems do not care about God. It simply does not enter into their field of apprehension. And so, uh, this is the first point of possible disconnection. In other words, then, something that is apprehended by one set of people, believers, is simply not under the wavelength, not under the apprehension of another group of people. And so the challenge for new evangelization is one that Newman described as enlargement of mind, quote, unquote. In other words, then, how do I bring the God question into the horizon of meaning for people who have no concept of God, right? So how does the God question come into my window, my view of life? Uh, three quick examples. Uh, the theist, God clearly, is in my view of life. For the agnostic, God is like uh, the person with cataracts. Okay? Uh, God may be there, but it's too, uh, too cloudy, actually, to view. An atheist, the reason is God in sight? No. There is no God that can ever come into sight. So maybe that uh, simple uh, trio of comparison will illustrate the apprehension element of disconnection and derailment. Right. Uh, move on to the question of inference. Um, inference is not um, entirely a common expression, although we do it all the time. Uh, what would be a STEM vocabulary for it? And I'd like to suggest data, uh, data collection, data analysis, and data hypothesis. And in looking at the process of inference, it seems to me this triple data collection, analysis, and hypothesis, even though I've enumerated them as three steps, they're going on simultaneously. And that is involved in the process of inference. Now, uh, let me make um, uh, comments about each one of them. A data collection. Right? Uh, we do this all the time. Uh, and if you're a fan of uh, crime scene investigation, well, I, uh, you know that this is part of the entertainment. If you're a Sherlock Holmes fan, then you know that that's something that uh, Sherlock Holmes is always doing, okay? Uh, data collection means uh, absorb information. And the good news is there's lots of information out there to absorb. 
The bad news is data collection overload. And so one difficulty about data collection is I always can find more data to consider. And it seems to me that is part of the STEM temptation. In other words, then, uh, you say uh, to a STEM, you really should believe in God. And the STEM might reply, oh yes, that's a good idea, but I really need more information before I make a decision about that. And, uh, data analysis. <clears throat> uh, each datum can be considered not only as part of a collection, but each datum can be considered individually. Right? And one of the things that happens with an individual datum is it can take on a life of its own, a fascination of its own. One aspect of that fascination is how does this datum fit with other data? And when you find the, may I say, oddball datum, uh, you can become so fascinated by that that the rest of the picture does not matter. All right? And that, again, uh, is a temptation. If the history of science, you have come across uh, Darwin and the wasp, uh, Darwin becomes focused upon this particular type of wasp that uh, lays the eggs in another caterpillar. And what do the eggs do when they pass? They devour the caterpillar. And consequently then, Darwin said, how could there possibly be a god who permits such an anus type of uh, reproduction, right? So I cannot see God in this individual in this in particular data. And therefore, I reject God uh, completely. The third step is data hypothesis. What does the complex of data mean as a whole? Now, I'd like to suggest that these three steps are interactive. Uh, the hypothesis is usually at work at the very beginning of data collection. In other words, what type of data do I collect? I already have hypothesis. I already have a set of mental cubby holes into which I put the data that I'm going to consider. And for the nun, for the STEM, the question is, what do the data mean as a whole? And scientists are always constructing hypotheses as a way of explaining the collection of data that they are considering. And so one of the questions for the STEM is, is the God hypothesis allowable at all? Mm -hmm. uh, third point uh, is assent, right? Uh, the uh, question of sometimes assent, particularly notional assent is almost automatic, right? And so if you say if A equals B and B equals C, A equals C, no problem. However, when it comes to real assent, from the transference of the notional to the real, that is where the process can easily derail. And if I may share with you uh, a family secret, not really secret at all, uh, one of my relatives is a thoracic surgeon. Right? Uh, he operates uh, on perhaps a dozen, 15 people every week uh, and clips off part of their lung, sometimes deflates the whole lung, and so on. And what was the cause of the lung problem? Smoking for the most part, okay? After a hard day in the operating room, what does my relative do? Mm -hmm. uh, he goes outside because they don't allow smoking in the hospital. <laughs> he goes outside and has a cigarette or two, all right? So transferring from a notional to the real is not intellectually automatic. It involves the will, right? And so 
Uh, this, it seems to me, is part of perhaps the pivotal state in the new evangelization. Not only presenting theological arguments in favor of the faith, but the movement from the theological or the notional to the reality. Okay? Uh, kind of a conclusion in uh, the reason for this very um, succinct uh, summary uh, is to give time for Father Peter and for anyone else to make comments or observations, either pastorally or theologically. Uh, it seems to me that uh, theological arguments never of themselves lead to faith. And I think your treatment about Newman and conscience, his, Newman's argument from conscience for the existence of God, mm -hmm. uh, I found those reflections uh, mm -hmm. kind of leading into what I have to say here. Uh, so then um, theological arguments do not necessarily lead to real faith. The will is always involved. And new evangelists may find it helpful not only to use Newman's steps to ascent, question, inference, mm -hmm. ascent, or perhaps in other terms, apprehension, data collection, analysis, and hypothesis as leading to mm -hmm. ascent. Not only look at the process, but also look at the points in the process where derailment disconnection mm -hmm. can occur. Okay. Okay. Well, just one very, very, very brief comment is that seventh chapter that uh, uh, Father Ford is referring to on Newman and Scotus uh, does, uh, although there are many, many chapters, your two chapters contribute very immensely too, but that seventh chapter does what Cyril O'Regan in our theology department describes as the heavy lifting in the book. <laughs> Besides the weight of the book itself, 700 pages, but, but uh, the heavy lifting really is in the originality. The originality is in that seventh chapter, and I guarantee you, one reading was not enough. Isn't that correct? <laughs> Two readings weren't enough for me either, or three. So, so Father Peter, I turn over to you, and this is magnificent lead into this kind of discussion to figure out why that is the heavy lifting in this book. What makes it so original? Why can't you Google that any place, in any tome, in any opuscula, in any opera, anywhere? This is original, and it's waiting now to throw out the seeds on very fertile ground so someone else may water and go further with it. Well, uh, much more I could have added to that in, <laughs> in Newman after I read it myself. And how did I ever get all these points? <laughs> but anyway, listening to Father's presentation with practical application of what Newman is trying to set forth and which in a way he also justifies speculatively. This is the whole point of showing the resemblance between his thought and that of uh, particularly Duns, 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 Duns Scotus. Or as, as I put it, as it were, Newman stresses the phenomenological aspects. Newman stresses the uh, uh, notional, if you want to use it, uh, 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 but they are complementing each other. Their coins. Now, the point I noticed in your presentation, I thought it was a very good point you, you made. The ultimately, uh, Newman's present presentation of a way of observing how people th uh, actually actually think always brings us to a point. And this is a key point: enlargement of the apprehension. Mm -hmm. largeness of, uh, of, of, of view. That occurs in many of the other writings of, uh, of, of, of Newman. Uh, the opposite is narrow-mindedness, so there's a lot of that around. Uh, um, but I think that what, is, uh, what constitutes the basis for this enlargement, not merely hypothetically, but really, and I would say the difference between knowing a person, including myself, and knowing a thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is one of the problems, the problems of uh, undermining the influence of Immanuel Kant that empirical science is the science. It's one of many sciences, but it's not the, the, the science. And that ultimately, theology or knowledge of God is knowledge, knowledge that is pers uh, personal. 
what is the nature, what is the characteristic of the knowledge of all of us in some way or another, as you mentioned, as it comes in the argument for God's existence from, from conscience. It's not excluding the other form formulation, but it's bringing us some, to something to very close to what everybody in one way or another has an experience of. They can sense the distance between knowledge of themselves as persons. They have a certain independence which things don't have. Things can be used in various ways or abu uh, uh, abuse, but persons are not to be used. Mm -hmm. That is what, one point. And there are many others you come across in, in Newman. It's always, it's always impressed me how, how the practical way of dealing with, uh, conversing with people who say they don't have any interest in, in, in God, they acknowledge the possibility, et, 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 et cetera, to bring them, as it were, to, to a more realistic con contact with, uh, with what, uh, uh, <coughs> basically what, what, what they know but do not always understand clear, uh, clearly. I think that's very important today because uh, we see that's missing in so many people, including people who claim to be Catholic. They have no sense of what conscience is. They have no sense of the dignity of the, of the person as inviolable, uh, even if they happen to be in the uh, state of, uh, state of mor mortal sin. There is something unique in the, uh, in the per person, and therefore the knowledge connected with that. Many other examples could be given, but I'd be going on the rest of the morning. Father, do you think, I, I agree, most people would not respond to a, a, a logical argument for the existence of God or a demonstration, but do you think there are some? And, and have you had any experience of them who would be sincere? intellectuals to... I'll uh, to, uh, give one uh, example, um, and I can't remember the person's name. A student, um, when I told him of his fast, uh, interested in John Henry Newman, he said uh, he was uh, a Navy officer. Uh, he was in charge of an aircraft carrier, and as I understand aircraft carriers, you can put them on autopilot, uh, and you have the whole ocean, and the only uh, time you need steering is when you come into a port. Uh, uh, however, you do need a human being on bridge uh, just to make sure that the autopilot doesn't uh, go off. And he said so. Uh, he w uh, picked up a book, uh, and apparently uh, the Navy library on board ship is not all that uh, expansive, but uh, he picked up a book and it turned out to be uh, Newman's Apologia Pro Vita Sua. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, while it was uh, uh, his, as a junior officer, he got the midnight shift, and so he read the Apologia Pro Vita Sua while on the aircraft carrier, and when he got back to land, he said, ah, yes, uh, I want to become a Catholic. <laughs> so, yes, some, uh, my, so the example is, yes, sometimes people read themselves uh, into the church, but I uh, found that example of uh, a notional reading oneself into the church uh, with the Apologia Pro Vita Sua, you also have a personal dimension that uh, sort of ties the logical elements <coughs> together in a personal way. So that, that's the, it, when you ask the question, that's the example that comes to mind. Thank you. I think of the example of Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, and I forget whether it was um, the life of St. Teresa or the um, the, the mansions. Uh, the interior castle. Thank you. She, she, when she finished reading, she decided she was going to become a Catholic. Mm -hmm. But again, there is the personal dimension of her uh, meeting St. Teresa of Avila. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In that case also, there is the context that she was very good friends with the Catholics who had the book mm -hmm. that she then read. So that, I think, gives the context for her to then accept it. Mm -hmm. 
So, but I would say every book is an encounter with the author. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where you find your personal dimension, even even in a book. Yeah. So. Yeah, and if I may add that uh, the apprehension process is spiraling. In other words, Van, the way that I apprehend something today is not the way that I apprehended and mm. make it uh, exaggerated comparison. Uh, my apprehensions as a teenager, uh, most of them I would just as soon forget. <laughs> uh, but uh, apprehension is a process, okay? And that, it seems to me, is very important in the faith presentation, uh, that uh, one's apprehension uh, dimension or the window of one's apprehension is not fixed. Uh, hopefully it keeps enlarging. Mm -hmm. The problem is when the apprehension window is first of all a slit and, and it's like one of those slits in the medieval fortress. Mm -hmm. You can't do anything but knock out the stone to, <laughs> to get it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I just thought, you know, I, I really appreciate what you had to say and I'm, I need to read that um, about broadening the notion of teaching undergraduate theology, you know, is, can be quite a challenge because if it's a required course, many don't even want to be there. How do you get their attention? And I had, once I did a couple of times, it's called Survey of Christian Belief. That was an undergraduate course. I tell you, I thought I had great material and I got nowhere with those kids. The next time I tried it, you know what I did? I spent the first part of that course, I had each one of them choose from, and I drew up a list of martyrs throughout the whole Christian tradition. Mm -hmm. They had to choose one and research the life and significance of that martyr in their period of history. Mm -hmm. it, I was astounded. That got them interested. And then they didn't resist when I went into the uh, mm -hmm. other material. And I thought, it hit me once they were able to see this concretized in a very specific person, and they were, be, and then they competed. They had to draw themselves which one gave the best presentation. So they were competing in the presentations. <laughs> uh, that opened doors, you know. And I was just thinking of that because it's broadening the notional or broadening the base with which to begin, which I hadn't done previous to that. Well, I, I think too that. Uh, the current uh, generation of uh, college students very much STEM oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. um, many of them, uh, you, a uh, you ask, um, uh, when did you start a computer? Well, in Montessori school. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, they, they have been using computers, they have been using technology uh, since childhood. Right? And that is a radical, uh, to, me, to me, a radical change uh, in uh, the uh, American ethos. I find they tend to be moralistic deists, <laughs> in a way, you know, <laughs> even though they go to church on Sunday. You know. yeah. exactly. Well, uh, it, so, somehow I think the, the, that ex example that you just gave about um, the notional approach, uh, and then how does the reality relate from my, to my life. Uh, I think that that is something that perishes. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, because it isn't just an encounter with the, op, the, op, the object that is mm -hmm. separate from us. It becomes an encounter with our own selves mm -hmm. as, as we apprehend the object. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a back and forth happening in the reality. And so when something is concretized and turned into a person, not just a concept that's floating out there, I look at this person's life who died for something that because they cared about it so much, and now I'm encountering myself saying, well, what do I believe? Yeah. What do I care about? <clears throat> I wonder if Father Peter would want to say something about um, how he um, thought about the affinities between uh, uh, Scotus and Newman. How I discover how, how you how you uh, some examples of the affinities between uh, Scotus and Newman. That's in that in that seventh chapter. Well, relationship to what we have been discussing. Also, I would say uh, the relationship is between 
is in the, the immediate knowledge of the of the personal of the exi exi existence of the of the singular, not simply as it were something that has uh, come by way of uh, uh, inter interior interior pro process and the real ascent uh, ascent, whereas the notional corresponds to to those uh, that the process based on the concepts that are that are, that are formed and translated into the. The interior word that is, is spoken once we begin to, to to think about it. there are many there are many uh, instances of uh, that, but the most important thing is perhaps the, the conclusion. That if the language seems to be somewhat different in each of these uh, of these great uh, great 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 writers, but as they uh, when they begin to discuss the question of how you know a person per person at a certain point have to recognize that besides the process in human knowledge or uh, involved in using uh, creative intellect and shellac as, as we, uh, well, there's something that is radically simple. simple. The simple of, uh, affirmation of the existence of a person is a, is a, good, a good example. Now, despite all the changes, there's something that is permanent at the, mm -hmm. uh, at the, at the center, and that's very important for distinguishing, as Newman himself points out in many places, is very important for distinguishing being human life from the life of a brute. Life of the brute may seem to have a very complex and useful way of uh, gaining sense, uh, sense knowledge, but it's only sense knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's not truly intellectual in the formal sense of that term, whereas uh, human knowledge, even if it's uh, uh, only at the beginning, beginning point, always, uh, always involves some kind of, of uh, potential for the, uh, for the infinite, what Scotus calls a perfectio simplicita simplex. Pure, uh, pure perfection, perfection. It is formally identical both in the in the creator and the, and the, and the creature, and is open therefore radically, radically to a, an infinitive uh, dimension, even though naturally it cannot be, cannot be, 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 be resolved. This is one exa one example of of, of, of pa pa parallels. You know, some misread Newman ter terribly. They they represent his, his discussion of the noumenal as being something akin to a Kantian approach, but I do not find that to be be true. I would find it's the opposite. It indicates something that Kant deliberately denies that there's any possibility of really having a direct, immediate knowledge. Knowledge of everything proceeds through the senses, the senses, and then as were the process of uh, the categories of space and time and form of notion. That is uh, subject to complete, complete change. We can dispense with the God hypothesis now, <laughs> no, no, which is a, uh, which is one famous. I don't know if it is true, but the, uh, the conversation between Napoleon and one of the French intellectuals of the uh, revolutionary period. How come you didn't mention God in your, in your latest, uh, latest book? Because we don't need the God hypothesis was the supposed, mm -hmm. supposed answer, which is a complete and total denial of what both Newman and Scotus have in, have in common concerning, the, concerning the, uh, the, the radically infinite char character and permanent ca 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 simplicity, put it that way, or with Scotus uh, using of a phrase coined by Saint and and some of the perfection of simplicity is not simply a simple perfect perfection, which may be found in God eminente, mm -hmm. uh, eminently, but not 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 formally. Whereas what distinguishes the created person is precisely something that can be found in God as as well. Without that, uh, our, we have no basis for a discussion of theology with anybody. Mm -hmm. I don't think you take up a theological question with your pet cat. <laughs> Even the cat is very clever at imitating. Thank you. I know, I know in that chapter you give several uh, examples uh, mm -hmm. of uh, affinities between uh, Newman and Scotus and how mm -hmm. one might argue it uh, from, mm -hmm. the, uh, from the primary texts. But uh, it's uh, it is a challenge well, for us to read it and to to absorb it and to put it in this context of the behind uh, well, really yeah, the uh, university. I, I, my memory is not so good this morning. <laughs> I have to look at the book to remember all the things I said. There, <laughs> <laughs> but I think if you once arrive at that point where you the, the unchangeable the uh, unchangeable element 
in human co uh, co cognition is the relationship with a, pers a person, you're in a position then, then to make serious argument that the people can, uh, can follow concerning the existence of God. But first you must make that contact and help them to realize that what is called empirical science is to be a very valuable form, form, form of knowledge, but we will never understand that, that knowledge until we have grasped the difference between, between human personal cognition and the pure sense con uh, cognition of the, uh, of the, of the brute. That, that is the way we can help people from being derailed, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. yes. Father, you uh, uh, Newman supplies lies, and in his own way, Scotus does the same, the same thing. It's amazing how many, uh, many phenomenological insights that are called that, but they are present there in his observations on various epistemological th uh, theory, and how many times, as we were in the discussion, his conclusion is in fact very similar to that of, uh, uh, that, uh, that of Newman. If you have only the logical argument, however objective it may be, you don't have anything that leads to assent. Assent always involves this personal d dimension, a recognition of it and a, respon a response to it. To fail to respond to it is to deny oneself in a very profound way. So when you said uh, personal being unchangeable, uh, the, the unchangeable aspect being the, the person, the yeah, if you right? refuse to interact with with with, 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 with that, it, it leads to an attempt to destroy your own person. Right, and so do you think that that's related to divine illumination theory, or like how well, we well, know? Yes, what it is. it's certainly uh, the divine illumination theory of Saint Saint Bonaventure, which is put in is slightly different terminology right? with its metaphysics based on university, and the metaphysics based on university ultimately in theology points to the inca 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 incarnation, the point where the created and the uncreated uh, uh, meet, meet, meet in view of uh, salvation and and bliss. So you can argue this all you want with me, but the fact of the matter is that there is a connection between the uh, the, uh, the exposition of St. Bonaventure of divine illumination in question four of the disputed questions on the knowledge of, of Christ. Uh, that's a theological disputation. What's the divine illumination? It's not the, the illumination that is encountered so many times in this or that spiritual ex experience, and which is merely a product of the, you know, the uh, very often of the of the of the mis, uh, of, of the, of the mis, mis, supercharged. Uh, but the divine illumination, whatever criticism you can have of the ter ter termin terminology is explained quite nicely by saying, but in the end, if you eliminate eliminate the Lord, and more specifically, specifically the, 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 the human knowledge of, 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 of Jesus, yeah. you will never be a certain of anything. And you will never yeah, make an yeah. absolutely certain assertion. You always leave open the possibility, <coughs> well, tomorrow I may hold just the opposite, just as, 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 as firmly. But Bonaventure is simply saying, then the reductio artium at scientiarum uh, at uh, 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 teol teol teologium is simply an aspect of this is the, uh, the, the, the the reality. We can get to a certain point with a kind of natural faith that natural Newman calls it the natural trust that we have of our facul fac faculties. This is what is wrong with Kant. You don't start out with that assumption. Kant arrives at that, but he doesn't recognize it because he refuses uh, the possibility of, uh, of, of, uh, of faith. And therefore he comes to a position which is radically ag uh, agno uh, agnostic, as Father mentioned. And the Holy Corp stems. Yeah. Once you accept the premises, premises of, of Kant, you arrive precisely at that point. Well, it might be interesting, but I don't have time today. Like the philosophers in the uh, Augur of uh, Athens with St. Paul, when he got to the resurrection, uh, <laughs> uh, something to be discussed in a uh, profoundly philosophical manner, they said, well, uh, it's time for the nap. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> uh, St. Paul didn't bother coming back after, uh, uh, after that. They had a good chance. Uh, they they, they uh, refused it for reasons which were uh, truly not very ad, uh, admirable, not honest re, uh, re, re, reasons. So uh, that is uh, the, uh, the university of being, the disjunctive transcendental, uh, transcendental and the use of, particularly for the, uh, for, uh, for the transcendental that is shared by, uh, uh, shared by the created, created, uh, created person and, uh, the, uh, and, uh, and the creator, the perfectio simplicitas simplex. 
therefore a distinction or a perfection, perfection in a creature which may be finite, but is capable of also being infinite because that's the way it is for, 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 formally, formally in, in God. Uh, with that, as it were, you have no ba uh, basis at all, or all for the, explain the difference between a person and a non-person non in the cre 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 created uh, world. If you want to live that way, fine, but I'm certainly not going to follow fa <laughs> value because I don't think it is on honest in in intellectual. This is what Scotus is saying, this is what Newman is saying, but you have to bring people to see it clearly. People are basically be good, uh, they're simply confused, uh, confused, not, not real, realizing it. They will indeed begin to respond. As you've, you've just heard some examples of that. We wonder why do they respond like that? But when uh, when you uh, when you touch the personal personal without any kind of, of re re reflection, everybody knows what you're talking about. I am and you are, and you go a little fur uh, further, further, and you come to the point where we want to discuss the we. Mm. That the person, a person is, has his dignity, but there's no such thing as the person that is not related to other persons. We all know that, if you want, say instinct, uh, in, instinctively. This is basically where I think we find a merger of thinking between uh, Scotus and Newman. I don't know how much of, uh, of New, uh, Newman, uh, 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 of Scotus and Newman actually read. Obviously, either in commentators or in many, I listed all the places I could find in, in the beginning part, uh, part, part of that. He clearly was acquainted with Scotus' mm -hmm. thinking and the Scotistic tradition and find it congenial to his own way of, way of, uh, way of thinking. He didn't fancy himself an expert commentator on, on Scotus, but I think he's better than most, uh, most who claim to uh, claim, claim that, uh, that be. But that was one of the, uh, the other point. Uh, the personal dimension, the dimension of uh, assent has this correspondence as it were, with the questions affecting the effect, affection. The human will is not in the first instance an appetite of the, uh, of the in, uh, intellect as it is in the Aristotelian uh, uh, system, but it is fundamentally the power to act on one's own to initiate an uh, action. Whether the, uh, the, the person acting is uh, impeccable or not, that's another, uh, not, 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 another, another question. But normally, as Newman remarks, remarks, just as is normally uh, the, the, the case to trust our intellect, so it should be the case, uh, the case to be, be uh, recognized what St. Bonaventure and Scotica said there is the tendency of the will to do what is good and to avoid what is, uh, what, what is, uh, what is evil, e evil. Whether or not by the power to choose on my own, I actually follow my, uh, 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 my, my, con my, my, con my conscience or allow my conscience to be malf mal 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 malformed. This brings us to the whole question of the, uh, 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 the in the practical order of the proof of God's existence involving the conscience. Clearly, Bonaventure certainly uh, uh, refers, to, ref refers to this ex explicitly. The role of finding God in our con in our, in our con uh, conscience or recognizing His absence but not not uh, uh, ex uh, existent. You find the whole pre presentation of one of his classic spiritual works, the Triple Triple Way, very definitely involves involves what Newman is saying about the con uh, the, the, the conscience, the well formed uh, conscience, the obligation to have uh, 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 because we are obliged, as it were, to do what is good, to be generous, and not be selfish. Uh, those are some examples of uh, what, perhaps what you're referring to. Thank you. I think we're, we're about five minutes over, so let's take that five-minute break, and then we'll, we'll hear from Jared, and we, we want to thank uh, our board here. Very good. Very good. I, I really like what you said in the audience.